Welcome to Drinks Coach, episode 71, English Pinot Noir. Mm. Vine sack or lowercase, Drinks Coach UK or lowercase. If you're watching this, go on the pull down menu, hit subscribe, hit the bell, get all the updates as they come in for new shows. Uh, there's usually one every Tuesday, one every Thursday. Been a bit of a hiccup recently, but we've got past that with second lockdown and everything. There's been a lot on. So, um, in my business, there are times which are very special where the entire industry, the, what people want to drink, turns on its head. I mean, look at the, the millennial metamorphosis between people drinking Pinot Grigio at home to drinking craft beer and gin, virtually nothing else. Um, back in the day when I was a wine buyer at Waitrose um, in the mid-90s, early thousands, you know, 55% of the wine that we sold at Waitrose was from France. 45% uh, was the national average. By the end of the first decade of the millennium, 25% uh, or less was French, and nearly half of it was Australian. Then South Africa and Argentina, and then Chile, and we're going through this incredibly turbulent time in, ter in terms of what people like or don't like to drink. And it comes down to a lot of things. People being more informed, um, Exchange rates are a really big deal um, because if your exchange rate halves, you know, we've had recessions and booms and busts over the last 20 or 30 years, then uh, that means the price of your wine doubles. So uh, massive impact on what people actually go out and drink because really people drink with their wallets, not with their heads or their hearts in general. OK, but um, what's very exciting is seeing an English wine industry create itself out of what appear to be a few diehard fanatics. Uh, some of them were the Lanters at Bolney who have been at it for nearly 50 years. Um, we saw sparkling wine in this country go from a little bit of a joke to actually I'd rather drink that than any champagne, which is an incredible change in such a short period of time. But with the world getting warmer for whatever reasons every single year, um, it was only a matter of time seeing as we were planting red grape varieties to make sparkling wine anyway that we would have the perfect storm, or at least the perfect unstorm, of having amazing weather for growing red grapes, vineyards full of Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, which have been planted to make expensive sparkling wines anyway, and then suddenly creating England's first premium still reds. Now, 2018 has been wild, widely heralded, certainly in Kent and Surrey, uh, if not the whole of, of England, as the finest English red wine, or well, finest English vintage of all time. I would actually go as far as to say that I think that some of the wines I've tasted in 2018, which were sparkling, weren't quite as good as those made in 2016, personally. Um, but um, certainly in terms of warm weather, 2018 is a sea change red wine vintage in this country. And everyone's very excited to see what some of the real kind of front runners have come up with. So we've got four wines here. Sorry, you guys, you've sent these wines to me over the last month, not three or four months, and I haven't used them yet because I was waiting to get a group together so I could actually do a proper show with them. So thanks anyway um, for that. Uh, we have four wines here. We have wine from Linda at Giffords Hall. You've seen me recommend her delicious Bacchus um, and also her quite delicious rosé, which is also made from Pinot Noir which is usually what Pinot Noir was used for. If you weren't making sparkling wine, um, you weren't making a wine deep and rich enough uh, to sort of satisfy in terms of red wine drinker. But they made fantastic rosés in the meantime, and they continue to do so, but for a price. Then we have um, Kenneth Balfour-Lynn's Amazing State down in uh, um, Kent, which is a, a ultra-modern, state-of-the-art place. You can go and visit, you can stay there, you can have a luxury weekend where you can learn to make wine and eat delicious food and stay in a lovely um, uh, room and so forth and, and really learn and immerse yourself in the experience of English red wine or English wine in general um, and also he specialises in making sparkling rosé wines um, but this is their 2018 Luke's Vineyard Pinot Noir or Luke's Pinot Noir sorry it's not a single vineyard then the Lanters who are down in Kent who have really positioned themselves while everyone's been getting particularly excited and freely about how successful the sparkling wine industry is in this country they've been specializing in making red wines largely and still wines in general uh, and i think they're positioning themselves that way so it'd be interesting to see what we think of their 
2018 Pinot Noir. But a lot has been said about it, so it'll be interesting to see what I think. Okay. And at the end, Miel Mucker, John Warrenchak. People used to confuse us in the press. Same initials, JW. He's half Ukrainian, half Australian. I'm a half Swedish, half Prussian. Um, so you'd sometimes get a picture of uh, John Warrenchak, and, the, and then it was a picture of me, or vice versa. Um, but uh, just so there's no confusion, he is 10 years older than me and much better looking. So, uh, John Warrenchak making wine for Litmus Wines. Um, if you go back to my Bacchus show again, where I mentioned the Giffords wine, I also say uh, there's an, an orange wine, which is a wine, a white wine made like a red wine. You put the skins in. Uh, I think Litmus Orange to date is the most interesting white wine I have ever tasted in this country. And it is an absolute stunner. And that we're talking about 2019 here. This is 2018 barrel aged Pinot Noir. So without further ado, let's have a look at these wines, take them one at a time and see whether the French should be shit scared or not. Um, at their prices, they probably should be. Let's have a look. Number one. Cheers, Linda, for sending this in all those months ago. Finally got round to pouring it. Well, that colour surprised me. That is quite a lot darker than I expected it to be. Um, in fact, I would go as far as to say that doesn't look like Pinot Noir. It does say Pinot Noir on the label. Uh, and it's St Edmundsbury Pinot Noir. St Edmundsbury, I, I think, is the name of the cathedral in Bury St Edmunds. Uh, and it is flipping old. I mean, like, 8th century or something. Uh, it must be the oldest cathedral in Britain. I could be wrong. Uh, I'm not a Church of England goer. But um, that's local to them. This is a wine made in Suffolk, ladies and gentlemen, which is extraordinary. So if anybody told me that you could get a ripe red wine from Suffolk 25 years ago, I would have sent you straight to the loony bin. Right. Colour? My hunch is there's a bit of Rondo in here. This is a great variety which a lot of people grow in the UK, along with a variety called Triomphe d'Alsace, where the flesh is coloured too. So when you squeeze it, it always has colour. This this just kind of doesn't look like burgundy to me, or doesn't look like peanut. But could be wrong. Well, it certainly has some smells of Pinot Noir. It may just have a little splash of colour, maybe. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe it's 100% Pinot Noir, but that's very dark. For any, Pinot Noir, for any Pinot Noir, really, at this price. So this is £14.50. £14.50 really isn't a lot of money for a Burgundy or a Pinot Noir um, from any country, really. Um, cheap New Zealand Pinot Noir is 11 quid, right? So pff, horses for courses. So very, very reasonably price pointed. Mm. Right, now it's all coming together. Now, now it's making sense. Lovely tangy, sour acidity kind of cranberry-ish like on the back palette there's some ripe fruit at the front kind of feeling there's some fruit in here which is less ripe and some fruit that is fully ripe so you've got this kind of dichotomy of the two playing against each other but there's rondo in there i think i can taste it inky uh elderberry like which is nice like elderberry cordial um i'm half swedish so we used to drink when i w w grew up uh, a thing called Lingon Saft, li made from Lingon Bear, Lingon Berries, which this wine reminds me of. It's a very, very attractive fruit, but very English hedgerow. Not really your grand orchestral Pinot Noirs of Australia or New Zealand or South Africa or France. Okay, but 14.50, perfectly reasonable wine. I would even serve that slightly chilled. It doesn't taste very high in alcohol. 11.5%, it's not. Lightly chilled, barbecued. Trout, maybe. Sea trout, something like that. Absolutely delicious. Lovely fish wine or light chicken wine. I'm having roast chicken with my wife later. Which is the reason why I open these today. It's as shallow as that. Okay, moving on. Balfour. Made by multiple award-winning winemaker Owen Elias and Victoria Ash at Hush Heath Estate. Look at the colour difference. I don't think you can, but if I swirl that... Yes, you can see colour really well with the spotlights. And then that one, much paler. Look at that. Um, this is the, the colour I would expect from English Pinot Noir. If you try and get more colour in the wine, which means leaving the skins in for longer, you tend to extract some of the nasty bits as well. So if you're chasing the colour, one ends up with a wine which is slightly overdone. A little bit like when you're making espresso coffee and you're a premium barista. If you extract the coffee for too long, not 13 seconds, but 18 seconds, say. 
you start getting all the foods and oil, the burnt caffeine characters, which you really don't want in coffee, and it spoils the whole. Now, um, in order to make the wines perfect, you just have to pull them out when the wines are still quite pale, which is not a problem. I have drunk incredible wines. One of the rarest and most expensive wines I ever drank in my life was Latash 1938 which I drank with a very famous guy called Len Evans in Australia, of all places. That wine is virtually priceless now. I imagine it would have a price tag approaching £100,000, if not more. <laughs> I'm not joking. Um wasn't then, but it was still very expensive. The wine was pale, like rosé pale. It was a Pinot Noir, but it was 15.5% alcohol. And when Len pulled the cork in his front room, on one side of the room, it was like there'd been an explosion or somebody'd spilt a vat of wild strawberries on the other side of the room. The smell engulfed the room. We were intoxicated by the smell. Quite extraordinary. Right. Right, okay. Fair comments. It smells like Pinot Noir. Really does. But it smells very, very pure, very clinical, very technical. It tastes like, or smells like, they've picked specific clones, and there are clones that that, prov that provide certain characteristics, um, which all come under the umbrella of Pinot Noir, many hundreds of them. Um, I'm thinking 114 here for some reason. Anyway, let's not get nerdy about it. But the wine smells like the first time I drank an Adelaide Hills Southern Australian Pinot Noir. Who would have thought <laughs> in my lifetime that I would have confused an English, rose, an English Pinot Noir with an Australian one? Well, I'm doing that right now. This is what it reminds me of. Incredibly soft in the mouth. Very juicy. Fluffy even. Quite simple, to be fair. This wine's £22.50. So it's £8 more than this. I imagine they spent a lot of time trying to get the oak right, trying to get the balance of this wine right. And I think at £22.50, which is the same price as a village Mercure these days, um, even a really bog-standard Cote d'Or red burgundy is more expensive than that from a co-op that doesn't know what they're doing. So £22.50... If you're looking to try and make premium single vineyard Pinot Noir, is a fair price. This wine, very slightly underwhelming, I have to be honest to say. But they seem to be going in the right direction. This wine is very aromatically pretty. It smells of raspberries, cherry. The palette is simple, but soft, gentle. Maybe it'll develop artefact in a bottle. Maybe it just needs two or three years to get a bit more kind of grungy. OK, where are we going to go from here? Right, well, we've got two more wines, which are increasingly expensive. We have the Bolnia Estate 2018, 25 quid. And we have John Warren Chack's Litmus Pinot Noir, 29 pounds. That's nearly 30 quid, ladies and gentlemen. That's quite a ballsy statement, if anything was. Let's try this. I have no doubt that John Warren Chack would not release a wine at £29, unless you felt it was worth the money. So I'm quite excited to see what these both behave like. Okay. Let's start off. Let's put these in, in shot so they can see the labels. They actually need to come a bit further back, don't they? There we go. A bit of a showdown here now. Both quite similar in colour, almost identical looking. Um, if anything, the litmus is very, very slightly darker and slightly... Pink, more pinkish but this this wine these wines look comfortably like Pinot Noir shirt um what alcohol levels are we looking at remember the gift was only 11 and a half this is 12 percent and this is 13 percent ah truth is out and 12 and a half percent for the hush heath okay so Bolney um and the Lancy Lanter family have been quite vociferous about saying that we want to make great red wine in this country and um a lot of people I suppose I imagine pooed pooed them when it didn't seem plausible at the time. Um but they've been doing very well and I've been reading about them in Decanter and all the other magazines and it seems that people are starting to really take a shine to their wines. Uh to date, I've I've got to be honest with you guys, I think they're doing a fantastic job and it's a big business now. I think they're making three hundred thousand plus bottles. Um but uh, I've never been completely overwhelmed by any of the wines. Um, so, uh, just being honest. That's more like it. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first Burgundian English Pinot Noir I have smelt. This wine smells delicious. Lots of layering. Stunning, in fact. Wow, that smells of... 
a little bit of nutty undergrowth, what we call, the, the, there's this kind of su- phrase in French, which is sous-bois, dried leaves on the floor, underpinning this kind of slightly earthy, dried leaf, herby character, underpinning b- incredibly rich smell of squash, strawberries and raspberries. And Pinot Noir isn't about the sense of smell and taste as much as it's about its poetry, its lyricism. That sounds a bit wanky, doesn't it? Let's call it mouthfeel, the texture, the way it flows in the mouth. I've talked about mouthfeel before. You can make gazpacho, chilled Spanish soup, made from peppers and onions and tomatoes and shit. You can make it two different ways. You can put it in a blender, so it's a smoothie, or you can chop it with a bit of salina, so it's got tiny little crunchy little vegetables in. Same ingredients, same recipe, but people can love one and hate the other, just because of the way it feels in the mouth. Maybe they don't like bits of vegetables stuck in their teeth. Maybe they don't like to drink the smoothie and pretend it's lunch. This wine has incredible texture. As I I once described it, it's like a duvet in the mouth. Um, the vicar of a very famous winemaker in Hemelinada, which is where Pinot Noirs really grow best in South Africa, once told this man when he was given a bottle of wine for Christmas to drink over his Christmas lunch, the vicar said, Son, your Pinot Noir tastes like the good Lord slipping down your throat in velvet pants. Well, here we have, ladies and gentlemen, the English equivalent of that. This wine has absolutely fantastic texture, I've got to be honest. 25 quid, it all makes sense now. I'd be very happy to pay that for this wine again. Wow. Okay, right. The line is drawn here. No farther, this line is the beginning of Pinot Noir in the UK. John, what have you got to say for yourself? Extra fiver, what does that buy you? (laughs) Well, well, that's a very, very, very different expression than Pinot Noir. Okay, this one. Fragrant, perfumed, even sensuous. It's kind of, oh, it smells... Like, you know, this is, I'm going to go off on a tangent here. I smell my wife's hair and she's got sort of, I don't know, strawberry shampoo in her hair. And you smell the hair and the shampoo. There's a real sense of, of, of sexiness about this wine. Very, very attractive, very pretty. And when you drink it, it's super silky soft and smooth. Like touching your skin like that. It's all very, very sensuous shit. And that's why Pinot Noir is so absolutely adored by the world because there's very few people who know how to make it and a lot of people who want to drink it this is dipping its toe in the category of proper pinot noir and i'm very impressed by it okay now this one first thing i smell is a little bit of gladswegian fight in the wine the wine's a little bit okay this wine feels like it's ready to go uh ready to um uh Dive into the fight and have a bit of a punch up. It's it's a little bit younger, a little bit more feisty, a little bit more aggressive. There's a slight high toned note, which is a phrase we use in the in this in this business, which means there's a little of spiciness on the nose. Mm. Mm. There's a whole heap of shit going on in there though. There's a little bit of balsamic note. There's a beautiful fresh raspberry note. There's some actual pe- wood tannin in the wine giving it a framework, which is telling me this wine is a teenager and it needs a couple of years just to calm the fuck down and it's going to become a much more exciting, much more thrilling wine in the future. It's a wine that needs time. Wow! Um, Another first experience. Two very different sides of the same coin. Sensual, delicate, pretty. Oh, it's going to be amazing with my roast chicken and cauliflower cheese later. This wine also, but... <clears throat> this wine has a little bit of tannin on the lips. It's just a bit more. It's a bit more of a tussle. Sometimes you don't want everything to be very easy. You don't want it to slip down the throat like it's grease lightning. You want to have a little bit of a fight as it goes down. And um, this wine is much more in the ballpark for those people who know Burgundy of a kind of a Corton style, a Lox Corton style of wine, or a Nuit Saint Georges, a Cote d'Or wine. And this one is your velvety, Volnay uh, kind of wine. Um, so very different back in the day when it was still okay to say you'd have said one was quite feminine and one was a little bit more aggressive or masculine which is all horse shit as we know now um so i'm pleased to hear that people aren't using those expressions anymore although i just did um but um two really exciting wines as they should be because there's not even an, an uber ride change out of 30 quid out of either of them so uh very very well done everyone 
um, this is the beginning of a new normal. Um, who knows what the weather's going to do, whether it's going to carry on getting warmer. But give us all, Linda, thank you very much. Um, the Balfelins, um, good effort, lovely wine, and actually very fairly priced at twenty two fifty. May I, I think maybe they do a more expensive one, which is a bit more fancy. But I've got to say that these two have absolutely opened my eyes to the whole idea of drinking red wine in this country. John, from the land seats, well done. See you next time. Thank you.